welcome back. In this episode, we return to Crean Larich to tackle Anne Castiel and Binya Chrún. Look at how the Scottish winter drastically raises the Munro's difficulty settings, and discover how the Lady Scottish Climbing Club overcame centuries of prejudice to blaze a trail for female Munro baggers. If you find yourself enjoying the show, clicking like and subscribing really helps the channel to grow and to create more free content like this for you to enjoy. Anne Cashtel is a 995 metre peak set back above Glen Falloch, flanked to the south by the neighbouring Munros Benyachroen and Ben Chavar to form a rocky triumvirate at the western end of the Crean Laddock group. Like Crook Ardren, this Munro presents a deep northern corrie with two bumpy ridges reaching north towards the A82. The rock tor from which this mountain gets its name is clearly visible from Glen Falloch guarding the true summit behind it from both the boot and the eye. Its even rockier neighbour, Benyachron, presents an impressive 200 metre cliff face to the north, and a small but galling rock step on its west face. Both northern ridges of Ancastel are viable, the north-west ridge offering moderate scrambling up occasionally intimidating rock steps and the North Ridge an easy ascent to a couple of interesting rock features in its final section, a jagged fissure and the eponymous castle. And Castel can also be reached by the enjoyably jagged southeastern ridge from the Bialik with Ben Yachruin. The North West Ridge is accessed from Derry Darek by the A82, around a mile north of the Falls of Falloch. From this picturesque dwelling, take the track leading directly up the hill, which soon dwindles to a path, and an intermittent one at that, which will lead you eventually to Stop Glash, the Grey Peak. Continuing southeast along the stony, undulating ridge, it soon becomes apparent that between you and the summit looms a seemingly impenetrable barrier of cliffs that, at first glance, may endanger the cleanliness of one's underwear. Fear not though, the path winds its way up through the rocks without difficult handwork or exposure and spits you out very close to Ancastle's summit. The North Ridge is easier, slightly more direct, and thus the more frequented of the two, and in terms of aesthetics, it's hard to beat the rather epic view to Ancastle from its second top. Beginning at a lay-by on the A82 south of Creenlarig, we follow the hydro track a short way before breaking off southwest over the heather towards the steep slopes of Strohn Kharav, the rough nose. A path zigzags its way straight up the face, efficiently gaining the 709 metre top, and beyond it, the higher, yet unnamed, 0.723 that reveals the aforementioned epic panorama and a clear view of the route ahead. Unfortunately, some height is then lost as we make our way over the undulating and aptly named Twistin Hill, before climbing again toward Ancastle's summit. Shortly before the castle lies its proverbial moat, a dramatic rock fissure several metres deep that you'll need to scramble into and out of, but don't worry, it's easy work and soon overcome. The next obstacle is more daunting. A direct scramble leads up to the exposed summit of the tour, and while simple and short-lived, in winter it may be significantly more technical, requiring crampons and an ice axe for security. Don't let it worry you though, as it's easily bypassed on its western side without any nasty drops or unpleasant exposure. Beyond the castle tour, a short slope brings you to the summit, and weather permitting, a 360 degree feast of Southern Highlands splendour. Greetings! About a couple of miles south of Crean Larrick, as those who've been following the show will know, when we did that ridge last episode. Today, we're climbing Ancastiel, and this is its outlying peak, Strohn Kharav. Well, this is us making our way onto the main ridge behind me. We've got Ben Oss and Ben Dubcraig of Glenconanish. Uh, we've got Kruach Ardren, it's the west face there, that we traversed in the last time. And a very snowy Ben Callum to the north. Yeah. 
In winter, ascending the Munros requires specialist mountaineering equipment, of which the most obligatory is an ice axe and crampons. While it may be hard to imagine such implements being necessary when stood atop a Munro's summit on a fine summer's day, winter conditions make the Munro's at least twice as difficult to climb for anyone and infinitely more dangerous. This calls more than ever for the mountaineer to know their limits and not to underestimate the severity of a winter route, even if you know from experience that it's an easy climb in summer. In winter the days shorten, the daylight hours dwindling, until at its nadir, the sun rises around 9am and disappears around 3.30pm, so daytime becomes limited and the risk of getting lost in the dark increases significantly. Both ascent and descent can often be much lengthier than envisioned, and it's prudent to allow at least as much time to return to the start point as it does to reach the summit. In winter, the Munro bagger is obliged to actively assess the viability of their ascent, by determining a point of no return, or if I'm not at this point by this time, I must turn back. An equation that, while as we'll see, can lead to frustration, drastically reduces the likelihood of you becoming an item on the evening news bulletin. The level of danger on any Munro is at its most severe in the winter time, and just so everyone is crystal clear on this, to attempt any Munro at this time of year is a serious undertaking that will exhaust you and crucially expose you to significant risk when you're exhausted. On average, around 10 to 15 walkers die every winter on the Scottish mountains, and these people aren't amateurs. The only person responsible for your safety on the Munros, unless you're roping up of course, is you. Not your companions, not other climbers, and certainly not mountain rescue services. I'm not trying to put you off or to scaremonger. I've personally experienced a lucky escape or two from horrible situations in winter expeditions, and I can assure you when things go badly wrong in winter, it can quickly become a special kind of nightmare that I would not wish on anyone. When things go right, however, experiencing the Scottish mountains in the winter Raymond is a sight that you certainly won't soon forget. And I've got your back with key facts and basic information that will help you to make informed decisions about your safety and to enjoy the wonder of winter responsibly. Well, we're up at about 700 metres now. Thankfully the nose is over. The main height gain has been done. And behind me here, the first top of the ridge. And here we are in point 723. Behind me you can see Anne Castiel. And this is Ben Yachroon. The castle beckons the walker on, and the terrain becomes rockier and steeper the closer to it one gets.
Well, here we are at the castle. As you can see, it's magnificent conditions. Beautiful powder snow. No more than a couple of inches deep at the most in places and drifts. Um, it's a very crisp day, very nice. Excellent visibility. Right now, I can see pretty much all the way up Glencoe, uh, way past the Bridge of Orkey. We're there, the Mamlorn Hills. It's all going very well so far. Onward to the summit. As mentioned, the fissure is easily crossed, and once at the foot of the tor, it's a fairly obvious scramble to its summit, and an airy traverse along its crest. The bypass path is obvious, easy, and unlike many other such bypass paths, actually avoids the exposure in danger. Here we are on the other side of the castle, the tor. I'm now on a call. And that's the true summit behind me. And here we are. Summit of Ancastral, the castle. 995 metres. And what a view. The first and most serious danger in winter is from the cold. This is managed by layering your clothing with the addition of a thermal base layer for the legs and torso. Heat retention is the key to comfortable winter mountaineering as once it's lost it can be difficult if not impossible to replace. While falls and injuries are often the headlines of fatalities, what is most likely to kill you on the mountains in winter is the deadly combination of inertia due to fatigue and prolonged exposure to extreme cold, leading the body to gradually shut down in order to preserve blood supply to the brain. This is hypothermia, and frostbite will soon begin to develop in the body's extremities, that is, your toes and fingers. Stay warm, stay safe, 
And remember, there's no such thing as too many spare gloves. The southeast ridge is a nice scrambly descent to the Bialach Buya, the Yellow Col. Okay, so here we are on the Col, uh, between Ancastal, Ben Yachron. For those wishing to do, Ben Yachron behind me. This bit is the hardest part, uh, the rest of it is pretty easy. I'm gonna head down this escape call here, as time is defeating me. So yeah, it's about 3 o'clock now. As you can see, the sun is getting fairly low. Uh, so I'm gonna head back, we've got about an hour and a half of daylight, two hours of daylight at the most. Well, here we are down in the valley, and the temperature has dropped considerably now that we're out of the sun. Basically, we're heading back down to Kur Arab, and we'll be back to climb Ben Yachron by its gnarly north ridge. In the last episode, we looked at the formation of the Scottish Mountaineering Club, but as mentioned, with most things that involved fun in the Victorian era, it was reserved for men only. Female climbers in the late 1800s confronted not only extreme mountain environments, but also, surprise surprise, extensive hostility from the male-only clubs of the time, and indeed Victorian society in general. To climb, women had to face not only the mountain, but misogynistic attitudes across the social spectrum, challenging everything from the way they dressed to how they spent their scant free time. Jane Inglis Clark was an avid hillwalker who loved the Scottish hills and knew that she had the same capabilities and fortitude as the men in whose expeditions she took part. She married William Inglis Clark, a member of the SMC, in 1884, and his fondness for technical climbing evidently rubbed off on her. Here was a chance to challenge her ability and resilience like never before, and by 1897 she was joining climbing parties on hair-raising ascents in the Monroes and far beyond. She had natural skill and composure on difficult routes, and between 1897 and 1904 took part in six first ascents on Ben Nevis, with her husband and other leading climbers of the newly founded Scottish Mountaineering Club. She was part of the second team to climb Abraham's route on Crowbury Ridge, considered by many at the time as the hardest climb in Britain. Jane also climbed annually in the Swiss Alps, the Italian Dolomites, and had experience of long, challenging ski tours. However, Jane had become increasingly frustrated with the patronisation, misogyny and ridicule directed towards female participants in these dangerous outdoor pursuits, and realised that her husband's beloved SMC had no interest in the concept of an all-female climbing team. An idea she had been attempting to realise since discovering her own aptitude for rock climbing. The Ladies Scottish Climbing Club was founded in 1908 at a boulder near the Licks Toll in Perthshire by Jane Inglis Clark, Lucy Smith and Mabel Jeffrey. All three had climbed extensively in Scotland and the Alps, though typically in the company of their respective male family members and friends. It was the era of the suffragettes, yet the perception remained widespread that a woman's utility to a climbing party extended little beyond making packed lunches. Of course, to the younger generation, it was becoming clear that this supposition bore no relation to objective reality. The founding of this all-women's mountaineering club in Scotland, just a year after the Ladies' Alpine Club in London, soon had the interest of like-minded women with a keen interest in mountaineering 
many of whom would become pioneers in their day in many ways. The first Ladies Scottish Climbing Club Journal of 1908 records the event thus. The Victorian era has seen the rise of many things, and the lot of man, collectively, has improved beyond conception. Sport in its many aspects has advanced with rapid stride, and woman, making up the leeway of centuries, has jostled to the front to take her place alongside man in many active pursuits so long considered to be alone suited for the masculine persuasion. Man, those Victorians loved a long sentence. But although women had shared in the joys of mountaineering with their husbands, brothers or guides, it has been left to the present gracious reign to find lady climbers banding themselves into clubs with the same aims of the various male climbing clubs. The first New Year's meet was held in 1909 and a programme of regular meets developed with the club visiting all the main climbing areas in Scotland such as Crinlarich, Glencoe and the Isle of Skye. Among the notable achievements of the club, Esme Speakman made first ascents of some formidable routes in Glencoe, including January Jigsaw, a classic severe route on the Rannock Wall of Bucoletive Moor in 1940. In the 1950s, Annie Hurst became the first woman to complete all of the Munros. In 1955, Betty Stark, Monica Jackson and Evelyn Camrasto formed the first all-women's expedition to the Himalayas. They explored the previously unmapped Purbal Shakumbu glacier and made a first ascent of a 6,000 metre peak on the frontier of Nepal and Tibet, naming it Galgan Peak after their lead Sherpa. In 2010, Kate Ross became the first British woman to climb all of the 4,000 metre mountains in the Alps. She had previously climbed Amadablam, an exquisite and highly technical 6,000 metre peak in the Himalaya. In an age where the idea of a woman even having recreational time to herself was still a revolutionary concept, these bold, indomitable women were trailblazers in more ways than one, and before you scramble for those stereotypes, these were no rolling pin wielding schoolmams, and shockingly as able and inspired to climb the Scottish mountains as any gentleman, even those with really fine beards. The current president and club historian Helen Stephen was taught to use an ice axe by co founder Mabel Jeffrey and remembered her as very warm, rosy cheeked, and welcoming, coming into her room like a burst of sunshine, yet tough as old nails. They were all characters though. They encountered opposition and prejudice from people who saw climbing as unladylike. But they were adventurous. They set off into the hills wearing long tweed skirts, which could get really heavy in the wet, and baggy knickerbockers underneath. If no one else was around, they would often just dispense with the skirts and climb in their knickerbockers. <sighs> Damn right. Tweed skirts on the Munros? Ain't nobody got time for that. Jane Inglis Clark was certainly no stranger to a turn of phrase, writing in 1929 on the 21st anniversary of the founding of the LSCC. Mountaineering, for women, is the very best of sports, for here there is no rivalry, no seeking applause, no possibility of heart-sickening sense of defeat. We leave our differences behind, and when climbing there is time to feel, to think, to be oneself. Mountaineering for women seems to have come as part of their emancipation, especially from the old conventional restraints. Indeed, it is almost impossible for the girl of today to realise the great difficulties and prejudices that had to be overcome in those early days of climbing for women. Today, the Ladies Scottish Climbing Club is still going strong, and for more information, or to find out how to join, check out the website here. Our return to Ben Yachron takes us along the track to the micro-hydroelectric scheme in Kur Arab, and beyond through the Kettles and Kames to the foot of the North Ridge. This is a rough and rocky ascent to a broad balcony, then up a steep band of rock to the dip in the summit ridge from where both tops can be reached.
here we are back on the road. It's a beautiful day. The temperature is about three degrees below Celsius. Up on the ridges it'll probably, in the wind, be as low as minus 20, but <laughs> hopefully we won't be in the wind too long. Ben Oss and Ben Dufkraig are completely snow covered, as are indeed all the hills around here. So it should be a fun, snowy day. Ben Achroin has come into view here. We're getting a little bit of spin drift here along the track, which will be markedly more violent further up, I would imagine. Up ahead, you can see the sun is rising over the north ridge there. That's where we're going up. Half a kilometre along this track, the track ends. There's a little dam. And the next two kilometres is basically a boggy, pathless trek to the lumpy foot of this uh, spur here onto the north ridge. Now normally that pathless bog would be arduous, but today hopefully most of the ground will be frozen over, given that it is minus two or three degrees at the moment, possibly going down to minus five later on. As I say, in the wind, as always, uh, the temperature will drop quite significantly today uh, because we have some very biting northerly wind bearing the gift of cold air from the north. Well, here we are at the dam. You can see the high castle and Benachron behind me. It's all looking very snowy. So, yeah, going to be some slippery slopes up there. Now, down here in the glacial valleys, you'll often find these miniature landscapes of miniature hills and glens. These are called kettles and kames. Kettles are the little valleys, and the kames are the little hills. Now, the glacier is lots of different sheets of ice moving at different speeds in relation to each other. And the deposits, that is mud, sediment and rock, are randomly shifted about until they reach the bottom. When the glacier melts, Meltwater forms the kettles that snake through the soft sediment, and thereafter a natural drainage route for streams and precipitation from higher up on the mountain. So the glacier recedes and leaves behind this strange bumpy landscape of kettles and canes. Looking up there to the Bialak Buya, between Ancastiel up there, Benyachron. Looking back down Cúr Erab to Benchalam and Glenfalach. Well, here we are on a very windy ridge. The route ahead looks fairly straightforward. 
I say fairly because it looks like it from here however it could harbour a couple of surprises it's very windy up here very cold and super icy I imagine it's only going to get more so the higher up we go Well, <clears throat> we're about 200 metres below the summit here, just on the last push up the hill. Now the snow is quite deep and intense here, so it's uh, necessitated me putting the crampons on. There you are, crampons are on, and the ice axe as well. It is very cold. Over there, crew of Karstren, completely cloaked in snow. And uh, behind me here, an amazing vista of snow covered peaks. And Castiel. And onward to the summit. Never let it be said that I'm a fair weather mountaineer, I tell you. These are alpine conditions. This is a Munro in winter. It's not for the faint hearted. Or indeed, for the easily tired. Deep snow makes it twice the effort, if not more, coming up a Munro. While snow makes the hills look spectacular, it makes for a serious impediment to progress up the Munros. Even a gentle slope with knee-deep snow can become an endurance course of unrelenting challenge and exertion. On steeper slopes, it becomes not only cumbersome, but dangerous, hiding features like rocks, dips and hollows, which, when encountered unexpectedly above steep ground, can throw you off balance and down a distinctly non-proverbial slippery slope. The ice axe significantly reduces this risk by providing a solid anchor to maintain balance in its large lower spike, and the means to cut steps into steep snow with its axe head, the flat-ended adze, and the curved serrated pick. The pick is good for softening hard crusts of snow or ice, while the adze is used to shovel out the snow to create a step on steep gradients. An ice axe is also used for self-arrest in case of a slip or tumble down steep snow a technique that cannot be performed with any other piece of equipment, for example walking poles or your phone. The sliding climber pushes themselves onto their stomach and holds the axe diagonally across the torso with the pick facing into the slope, driving it into the snow, where friction acts as a handbrake, arresting your descent and anchoring you to the slope. Knowing how to self-arrest is vital, and once learned, it increases self-confidence on intimidating ground. The summit ridge of Benacroin is rather confusing, and until relatively recently, it was assumed that the east top was its true summit. The multitude of cairns scattered around the summit ridge certainly don't help either. The true summit is in fact on the western hump of the ridge, roughly halfway between the col with the east top and the aforementioned vertiginous path up its west face. If in doubt, triangulate your position using a map and compass, or consult your GPS.
Once upon the summit ridge, I was exposed to the full force of the 90 km an hour winds, pushing the temperature down to a bracing minus 22 degrees Celsius. At this point, my camera battery died, and shortly after that, my phone, which brings us to another subtle effect of winter's icy hand. Unsurprisingly, minus 20 degrees Celsius is out with the operational tolerance of most electronic devices, including GPS units. The extreme cold causes electronic components like transistors to stop working, and the rapid temperature differential between lying idle in your rucksack and the heat generated by operating high-powered circuitry and processors, which can reach up to 90 degrees above Celsius, means instant condensation, drastic battery drain, and potential damage to analog components as they expand and contract. Battery drain is the most common foe of the winter bagger, which is why electronic navigation aids such as GPS units or your phone apps aren't reliable resources in winter. You know what doesn't run out of battery when you most need it? I'll give you a clue, it starts in map and ends in compass. Now let's just get this out of the way. Those cheap rubber slip-on snow spikes that you see advertised are for playing golf or walking to the shops and not, I repeat, not for the Munros. This isn't snobbiness. From my own experience, they are completely useless on rough terrain, detaching at the first awkward rock they meet. You need to invest in a solid pair of metal 10 or 12 point crampons that strap firmly to the boot and offer flexibility in the midsection. It's hard to overstate the increased sense of security and confidence one feels once wearing crampons on otherwise frustrating and intimidating terrain, and when you do, you'll see why I keep harping on about them. If you'd like to learn more about winter mountaineering and the techniques described, accredited winter skills courses are available through Mountaineering Scotland and independent mountain guides. Techniques like step cutting and self-arrest are best learned through practice, and I'd highly recommend such a course to anyone wanting to try a winter ascent of the Munros. Well, it's about four o'clock now. So, uh, as you can see, the clouds have closed in. The sun has gone down behind the mountains. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that it's still extremely cold. Nowhere near as bad as on the summit ridge, needless to say. Another translation is Hill of Danger. And there was certainly plenty of danger on the route that I took, that's for sure. The rock was rhymed, um, covered in a layer of ice up to about an inch thick. So um, you can imagine standard shoes or boots. On a 45 degree angle ice slope, you're, uh, you're going to be doing some Looney Tunes stuff. But there it is, the last of the Korean Lattic 7, the seven Munros of this range. Uh, we've now climbed them all. Thanks for watching. If you found yourself enjoying the show, hit the bell icon to see new episodes as soon as they arrive. Next time, we head to Bridge of Orkey to climb the magnificent Ben Doran and its formidable twin in the wall of Rannoch, Ben Andoy. Until then, enjoy your adventures.